should have been for you on Monday now. Well, very good morning, church. How's everyone today? And welcome to those who are online with us as well. Uh, please say hi in the notes and in, in the stream feed and let us know that you're here. And uh, we've got some visitors here today as well. So it's, it's uh, great to see new faces out here and, and we're missing a few faces. So it's, it's kind of nice. So it's a nice balance. A uh, lot of things coming up. So we got a lot of announcements uh, coming on. This Wednesday evening, we're going to continue our uh, Bible study series based on the movie The Shack that we saw a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so we're talking about uh, what God looks like in our lives each and every day. And so it's, it's a different view each week that we get to take. And it's really uh, kind of nice to be able to see these things and learn different perspectives on uh, this one is how can we know the heart of God and, and know what's going on there. Uh, so it's really great. And then coming up June 14th, um, we want to make sure that everybody's out there. Uh, we're going to be at the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival. We're going to be doing the flag retirement ceremony. Uh, for those that haven't come out for that before, uh, Pastor Terry and I, we read the names of all the deceased soldiers from the last year um, for the state of, uh, for our county, Lynn County, and this, this area in here. So. Uh, that begins at 6 p.m. and this year it's going to be a new location so it's going to be 4001 center point road so if you know where that is right off of uh, 42nd street over there at the freedom foundation so that's their new office new building and everything so they kind of wanted to celebrate so we're partnering with them this year to be able to do that and uh, i'm expecting i'll probably get the names on all these people but last year we had 310 names that we read a lot. And so for each one of the names, uh, we retire a flag. And that's what you're seeing in here is, is uh, how we retire the flags in there. Uh, it's a very moving time, so we invite you all to come and be a part of that. And then coming up, we have Orange Track Racing. So we convert this whole place and you have a track that runs this entire length in here and we do Hot Wheels racing in here. Hot Wheels, Johnny Lightning cars, Matchbox cars. And as you can see, there's hundreds of cars lined up uh, for the different races that go on here. That's gonna be June 10th. Uh, and we start registration at nine o'clock, racing starts at 10. <clears throat> then starting on June 21st, we are starting the group study of The Chosen. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this, this is a crowdfunded it's all done out <coughs> outside of Hollywood. I'm sorry, but right before the service started in here, I was asking Terry a question, and I was drinking coffee, and, and uh, I kind of went down the wrong pipe because uh, oh, no. I was choking. <coughs> anyway, uh, The Chosen starts on, on June 21st, and we're going to be going through <laughs> Season 1, Season 2, and Season 3 of The Chosen in here. And if you haven't had the opportunity to see these, we will be playing the episodes as well, as well as going through the study series. And it's absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. If you've never experienced it, it is really great. Then, coming up July 1st, 9 a.m., men's breakfast. We had men's breakfast here yesterday and had a really good, lively discussion. And of course, we had biscuits and gravy and pancakes and blueberry pancakes and sausage egg casserole, egg casserole. Oh, Yay, Denny. there's no lack of food so if you go away hungry it's your own fault so uh, but that will be coming up July 1st at 9 a.m. and then, then we have the movie that we've been waiting to be able to show so we've had the movie since January and we had to wait till it came out of the theaters. We have a license to show the movie, but we're gonna be showing the movie, Jesus Revolution. And if you'd like to see uh, some blips about it on here, uh, just go to our website and we will be able to have all kinds of media information. And on the back table back there, we have tickets. And if you scan the little QR code in here, it'll take us right to the site and you'll be able to see that. So if you have friends, have them come on in for the movie. Uh, seating is limited, so we had, we can figure, what was that, Terry, maybe 40? Between 45 and 50. 45 and 50, so we'll, we have, so this converts, by the way, so we have a screen that goes all the way across the front. It's a 12-foot screen, 
and uh, we have a high definition projector theater sound and so this converts into a movie theater completely with popcorn maker in the back steamed hot dogs and cheese dogs and and brownie bites and pop and all kinds of fun stuff everything's free so um, that'll be July 8th and uh, doors open at 5 30 and movie time at 6 so a lot of fun things coming up in here and we invite you all to be a part of it uh, let's open with a word of prayer this morning shall we gracious Lord and Heavenly Father we just come before you and we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here freely and openly to explore your word and to bring you into our presence here today to learn more about you learn more about your love and learn more about what you have for our lives Lord we thank you that uh, you have put this message and this opportunity upon our hearts today and we just open our hearts to hear your message this morning Lord come into our presence right now and we invite the Holy Spirit to just fill us at this point in time we pray these things in Jesus name so this morning in our call to worship Pastor Kerry has chosen Ephesians 3 17 through 19 and this comes from the New Living Translation and it says then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong and may you have the power to understand as all God's people show how wide how long how high and how deep his love is you experience the love of Christ through its though it's uh, too great to understand fully for ourselves then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God so these verses that we have here talk about you know if you ever look at plants or trees or something like that you notice that even in a drought even in a time of severe drought the trees with the deepest roots still flourish because of the roots go down deep enough in order to be able to get the nourishment they need to be able to survive and it's the same thing with us as our knowledge of God goes and grows our roots become deeper and we find out all of the things become revealed to us of God's nature through his love so these verses here that we have are about the Holy Spirit and about revelation and as as we learn and grow in God's Word then our spirit he reveals through the spirit through the holy spirit to us he reveals his spirit for us and what he wants for our life and the spirit gives us revelation so we might have the power to understand and act for what god wants us to do and paul prayed that the ephesians would be given power not power to act but power to be able to understand the extent of god's love and that's what this is talking about as you your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong, keep you rooted in the word. Only the Holy Spirit could reveal this to us. That God's limitless and gracious love is revealed ultimately in Jesus and his sacrifice for us. The work of the Holy Spirit is always works to help the church remember Jesus and remember his gospel and appreciate the love that God demonstrated to us at the cross. And see, that helps us to understand the purpose the, which God was carrying out as Jesus was on the cross for us. So, when we begin to comprehend his love and the depth and the breadth and the width of his love, then we begin to understand how the Spirit gives us power to act in that love. It all begins with prayer and intercession. And Paul prayed for the knowledge on a scale too great for and that's what it means in here when when he says it's too great to understand fully and so that's what we're we're coming to be is as it's revealed to us we can't understand the depths of God's love fully so we have to be immersed in his love in his word all the time in order to really understand it such blessings come through the Trinitarian God the Holy Spirit is your inner being Christ in your heart filled with God's fullness and if we follow these words that Paul wrote in here it leads to discipleship and an enabling power for us to be able to move through and to deal with the things that we have to deal with in the world today and there's a lot of stuff out there a lot of stuff to deal with 
inner moral power is necessary for the obedient discipleship. And the Holy Spirit then provides that dynamic power that we need for living victoriously. And then that leads us to Jesus Christ, and more specifically to his love for us. Jesus loves us more than we can ever know and wants us to progress in that understanding of his love. And in loving as he loved, then we are supposed to pass that love on to one another as fellow members. And I think if we all did that, we'd have a much better world to live in today. So I'm looking forward to Pastor Terry as he's gonna walk us through that question of how can I know the heart of the Father, which gets to the very being of God's love for us. Shall we pray? Lord God, we uh, ask that you would open our hearts right now to receive your message, our ears to hear, and for our mind to just be revealed through your spirit to us in this message that you laid upon the heart of Pastor Terry to share with us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are a good God, and that though we are not worthy of your love, you made us worthy through your Son, Jesus. We praise you and thank you. videos for the digital generation because that was the whole movie in about 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> the question came up and is asked and we're going to go through and try to answer that this morning on how can i know the heart of the father what is god's heart for us and i gotta start with i know that several of you are parents in here some of you might not be but or yet, but some of you have been parents, and those of you that are watching online, some of you have also been parents. But let me ask you this, this is rhetorical, nobody has to raise their hand or do this, but how many of you have or had parents at some point in your life, including at your birth? Okay, right. that now should cover everyone, not just the parents, but everybody. But I gotta give the parents that are either online or here this morning kudos because Parenting is a tough job. I raised, with the help of my wife, three daughters. That was a lot. I don't know what it's like to raise boys. I don't even guess. I've heard it's not as easy. I guess I'll leave it to those of you that have boys. But when you think you might just be to the point of figuring things out on raising your kids, then they, what do they do? They move into a new stage of life. It's almost like buying clothes for them, especially when they're young. It's like every four to six months you're buying new clothes. But they go through those different stages. And then as they get to this new stage, and as my oldest daughter's about to find out in about a year and a half, she'll have a teenager. And so she'll be entering into a new phase. And I, I've been praying already for her because I remember what that was like. Now, let's go back over the last few weeks. We've been focusing on some big questions that have been drawn out of the movie that we watched. It's now been four weeks ago. It's gone by very quickly. And those questions come out of the movie The Shack. Now, we've said this over and over and over again over the last several weeks. This is a work of fiction. There is no uh, biblical foundation in the movie other than the fact that it raises some really great spiritual questions and that's definitely worth seeing and we do have it it's currently out on loan as soon as it comes back you're welcome to check it out and watch it if you have, don't have it or haven't seen it but it's a movie and as you saw in the, in the that little brief video it's rich and beautifully told and it leads us into much biblical truth. It raises so many big questions that we experience in our, in our real lives. Even if 
well, even if reluctant sometimes to meet those questions head on. A rhetorical question again, how many of you have had those questions that you just avoid or those things in your life that you just avoid? And today we're going to be asking that question, how can I know the heart of the Father? And the question that maybe for some of you pops up is, why does that matter? Because understanding what lies in God's heart allows us to move beyond blaming and being angry and all that doubt and all that mistrust. It allows us to understand and trust Him. And these are essential things in for not just a relationship with each other, but with the Father. Now, to set up today's video clip, because we've got a little bit longer one, Jesus uh, has sent Mac up a trail to a mountain. So if you've seen the movie, they come to this precipice and, and Jesus tells Mac that he needs to go on further. And he's like, you're not coming with me? And he says, no, this is for you to move on beyond that. And it's there that Mac finds himself in this cavernous room where he encounters Sophia. And Sophia represents wisdom. Now, Mac does not understand why he's there. And that's been kind of the, the theme throughout the movie. He doesn't understand each of the individual scenes that he's in until after he gets through them. And so Sophia tells him, you are here for judgment. But there's a twist to that. And the twist is, she says, today you are the judge. Now, how many of us in our lives oh, want to be the judge? We want to be able to judge the things that are going on around us. We want to judge other people. Well, here she says, Mac, today you are the judge. And he's reluctant at first, but he gets on a roll with a little bit of prompting. And so we, he starts talking about murderers and terrorists and abusers, his own father. They are all worthy of judgment. But here's the thing. Being judge is not as easy as, as easy as it looks. Let's watch. Can I say it? Absolutely. God is to blame. Well, if it's so easy for you to judge God, You must choose one of your children to spend eternity in heaven. The other will go to hell. I wonder how many times that took for her to do that and do it with a straight face. But can you imagine having to choose? That's like being in an accident and, and or your house is on fire, and you have to choose whom you will save and whom you won't be able to get to and will pass. It's a very hard spot. It's a tough spot to be in. And I think, I think as we go through, as you go through the movie and watch it after that, he's caught off guard big time. But what would you do in his shoes? So what we need to do is we need to move beyond the blame game. So let's move beyond blame. And if you think about it, we're pretty good at judging others, yeah? I know I've been there. I know I have done my fair share of <clears throat> blaming and judging others when I had no right. And there's people, I mean, they spend a lifetime. And I'm not talking about the judge that sits in a courtroom. I'm talking about everyday people all the time that are judging people as they go throughout the day. Um, we've got a young lady that's been coming on Wednesday nights and, and she, said, she basically says, yeah, I judge people as they drive. <laughs> that's easy to do. It's like you get caught up, what do you do? You judge how they drive. That's it. It's something that we do all the time though, don't we? We make snap to ju judgments about the way and this sounds a little too uh, watered down, but we literally sometimes 
will make judgments about the way people walk or the way people talk or the way they look, the color of their skin, the clothes that they wear, their facial features, their body composition, you name it. There's all kinds of little stuff that we judge people by and we blame others for things that we're going through. We might blame our bosses or our employers or for conditions we don't like at work. Recently, every year we go through, as I work in a call center, we go through a process of bidding for shifts all over again. And the, the whole thing of being ranked from top to bottom and how you fall into that. And in January, my boss came to me and said, hey, we're changing up the ranking system. We're going to do it this way. These are the three things that we are going to use. Those are different than last year. Now, if we took those metrics from last year and put them in the new rating system, you would go from number 11 to number 34. Now, <laughs> heart sunk. My... Uh, Self-confidence went into the wastebasket. I mean, it just was. <clears throat> After the first month, I was third. Now I currently sit on top of the rankings. I didn't sit there and judge or blame my boss or my employer for the condition. I took ownership of it. And I went beyond that blame game. And I made the change. Now this last month was kind of difficult. That's where it's good. I don't know where I'm gonna land, but hey, it is what it is. I'm not gonna blame somebody else for that. That was on me. I'm not gonna blame my customers that I've talked to because they were all rude and just nasty. Well, no, no, I have every control over what was happening. Beyond that, we like to blame everything else. So right now, I don't turn on the TV anymore for the news. I don't like picking up the paper anymore because everybody's blaming the government or our leaders for events and, and policies and we that we feel affect our lives. We want to blame someone else for the way that things are. We like to blame other people for the hurt in our lives. We like to blame God because our lives aren't going the way that we want them to. I remember sitting and I've told some of you this before, I remember sitting on the floor in front of the couch after my first, after my divorce from my first wife, and I'm playing, before video games were really a thing, I was playing solitaire with real cards on the floor. And I'm blaming God, and I'm having that conversation and I'm blaming him for every aspect of that divorce. A few years later, after he let me kind of stew in that, he kind of went, along the side of the head and I realized that it wasn't God. I was putting blame in the wrong place. I was blaming God for the hurt in my life when he really didn't have anything to do with it. It was choices that were made. Now we might not say aloud, but how often do we feel like Mac when he said, absolutely, God is to blame. We watched a movie the other night that Diane's been wanting to see, and eventually I think we'll be showing it here, The Girl Who Believes in Miracles. Now, some of you may have seen it. It's just a couple of years out. In it, one of the characters blames God for his son's death. Ironically, there was another movie we watched, the same actor playing a different role who blamed God for his son dying. That would have been the original God's Not Dead movie. It's easy to blame God when we don't want to see beyond what's right in front of us. And yeah, it is. It can be easier to blame God and others for the pain that we experience, because what don't what do we don't do or what do we not do? We don't go to the root of the problem. We don't find out what the real problem was. We just try to put a bandaid on it or just paint over the mold. Nobody will notice it just rent it out again. It maybe is a part of it is a sense of guilt that drives us to accuse others to be able to justify our actions. The judgment can bring a sense of power and security as I'm better than you because I just judged you for being wrong. The problem with that though is that judging only compounds our pain when you compound your pain, it never removes it. And there's a 
problem with all this judging that we do. The problem is the role of judge, it's not ours. The role of judge doesn't belong to us. When we look at scripture, the Bible tells us that the job belongs to God alone. Let's look at James 4.12, and this is from the Amplified Version. It says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, the one God who has the absolute power of life and death. But who are you to hypocritically or self-righteously pass judgment on your neighbor? The Apostle Paul spelled it out that it's not up to us to get even or even to deliver judgment when we've been wrong. He wrote it this way in Romans 12, 19. He said, Dear friends, never take revenge that to the righteous anger of God. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay back or I will pay them back, says the Lord. God promises to take care of it for us. We don't need to. Bless you. Where we often get misguided is in our view of God as judge. People see God as ultimately too judgy. Yeah, but he is righteous. He's a righteous judge. One who will treat us fairly when it comes to justice and to mercy. Too many of us have the tendency to equate God the judge as a vindictive enforcer. I think of the movies, you know, you, you got Vinny who's working in for the mob and he's the enforcer. And you know, it's like he's got the cotton in his mouth and he's going out to take care of things. That's not who God is. He's not vindictive. He's not an enforcer. In fact, he is eagerly waiting for us to... S he's eagerly waiting for us to look to him when we have stepped out of line. And what will he do? He will give us a blast of, of his love, of his mercy. In week one of this series, we discussed it's how it's too easy for us to separate the character of God and view what happened on the cross as the brutal father pounding mercilessly on the innocent son. So people go, well, if God loved, loves us so much, how can he love us that much when he put his own son on the cross? He nailed him to the cross. But it's, again, it's not an accurate view of who God is. In the movie, Matt tells his daughter, Missy, a story about a waterfall in Oregon called Noma Falls. And they, they, she finally convinces him to stop their drive to the campground at the falls so that they can see it. And the story is about an Indian tribe that was being devastated by a terrible illness. The chief and elders met to figure out how to stop this plague from wiping out their tribe. And the chief knew of an old prophecy and that old prophecy says this the illness would be stopped if the daughter of a chief gave up her life for her people but this was too great a price and they would not ask anyone to go that far but as the story continues the chief's daughter heard about the prophecy and knew what she must do she makes the decision she loved her tribe so much that she climbed high up to the cliff's edge and jumped. Now, if you've never seen Multnomah Falls, this, I mean, you, when you look up at it, you're looking, you feel like you're looking halfway up to heaven. It's that tall. And then there's the, the little stream of waterfall that comes down off of it. His tears flowed and he cried out to the great spirit in anguish asking for her death to be remembered. And the story then continues that the great spirit was moved and as the chief's tears flowed, water began to pour from the rocks, cascading down into the beautiful waterfall that flows in her memory, thus creating Multnomah Falls. Missy would later bring up the Indian princess story again, asking Mac, why is he so mean? 
Doesn't that capture our view of God sometimes? Doesn't that capture the, the view of God that the world has of our God? be a misperception that comes from a bad experience. Just like the couple of movies I mentioned earlier, the father has a bad experience, the daughter or his son dies, and therefore he blames God. How we view God can be greatly influenced by how we view our earthly father. Psalm 103 tells us this in verse 13, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The problem is, not all fathers have compassion on their children. And the fear, this is a righteous fear of God, but the fear these children have of their father is a fear for their very life, their very If you grew up with a father who lacked compassion, the words in this verse would be so much harder to grasp. If that's you, let me encourage you that God is not limited to the shortcomings of our earthly fathers, or to any human for that matter. Instead, God wants to redeem them. He wants to heal the hole that is in your heart. So many people run around looking for ways to fill that hole in their heart. They look for it in money, or they look for it through different addictions, whether it's pornography, drugs, alcohol. There's that hole in their heart. There's a story, and I'm off script now, there's a story of a, of a guy who went to church with his wife. And something happened at church. What it was doesn't matter. Something happened during the service, and his wife chastised him after the service. And the parishioners or the people in the church chastised him after the service. <clears throat> Even the pastor got So what happened? That night he went down to the bar. While he was at the bar, he knocked over his drink, expecting the same kind of attitude that somebody was going to get mad at him for knocking it over. No. The gal tending bar came and she wiped it up. Some people came over and talked to him. And the owner came over and gave him a fresh drink. He never set foot in that church again, but he was at that bar every single night. He was trying to fill a hole in his heart, and God's people got in the way. So when we're trying to feel or fill a hole in our hearts, there's an invitation that is offered freely to everyone, and that is grace comes from love. By definition, grace is a free and undeserved gift. It's part of the reason that we chose it as part of our name for our church. Grace Street Church. There, do you know there's not a single street in all of the greater Cedar Rapids area called Grace Street? We can plant a pole anywhere that says Grace Street out front, and that's it. We can call the driveway right here in the park and Grace Street if we want. Not officially, because I'm sure the city would get on us about that, but... Regardless, but we are at the intersection of God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, and God's forgiveness. It all comes from God's love. Salvation through grace is the whole reason that Jesus entered and experienced this world as a human, just like us. Now, we like the idea of grace instead of judgment most of the time when it applies to us. But it's easy to get hung up, like Matt does in the movie, when we start looking at who deserves grace and who doesn't. And although we don't want to be judged, we like that idea of justice and fairness when we get to build it up. 
We want evil people to get what they deserve. There are people out there that are furious at the thought of Jeffrey Dahmer being in heaven. Because before he was shanked in jail and killed, ultimately died from his wounds, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That's a hard one to swallow for what he did. If you don't know what he did, I'm not going to go into it right now. People want that kind of evil to go to hell. And we want to be sure that we get the good things that we've been promised. So in a world that's so marked by so much sin, so much evil, we need God's grace maybe now more than ever. And we need to trust his grace, not only for ourselves, but for the rest of the world as well. We can't, it's not like, you know, the scriptures tell us you don't take a candle or a light and, and cover it with a basket. Leave it on for everyone to see. It's not easy, is it? Sometimes it's way more difficult than we could ever imagine. We went through a study a few years ago called Total Forgiveness. Talk about convicting. That study convicted me that no matter what someone had done to me, I needed to forgive them. I needed to just walk out of that. That door was already open in the jail, so I needed to walk out of it. And so I was able to then forgive some people that I had not been able to forgive. But it wasn't easy, and it won't always be easy. And Jesus presents us with a different perspective. And let's look at his words as they spell out a different vision. In John 10, 30, he says, The Father and I are one. And then in 14, 9, he says, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And his actions reveal tangible examples of God's nature, complete, whole, and united. Triune. Jesus reveals a deeper view of, of the heart of the Father. And even with the power and authority to judge, Jesus being God had all the right to come and judge when he first came. And he didn't. He came. He loved. Now he spoke truth in love as well. When he talked to the religious leaders, he told them that they weren't doing things the way that they should. But he didn't do it in anger. John 8 gives us a beautiful example of what this looks like as Jesus encounters a woman caught in adultery. The religious people of the day wanted to judge and stone her, so they brought her to Jesus and they wanted to force him to judge her. He, they wanted Jesus to pass judgment on this adulterous woman. But instead, Jesus says this, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he bent down again and he was writing in the, the dirt. What happened? Do you remember the story? And I can imagine Jesus hearing the rocks that they were carrying hitting the dirt in that what had to be just silence based on what he had said. When they all had turned to leave and that one was left to cast a stone, Jesus told the woman that he did not condemn her either. What does he tell her? He says, go and sin no more. He forgives her. He gives her that grace. We have to drop the rock too. We have to figuratively just drop it. How do we grasp the grace that we've been given and extend it willingly to others, even to those who have hurt us? How do we understand and feel the power of his gift that shifts the nature of our being? Because when we go from being judgy to being, forgive, to being forgiving, our very nature then that we are able to connect to the Father's heart. 
In the movie, Mac finally gives voice to what he's been feeling for so long. God is to blame. God is to blame for all the suffering and the atrocity in the world. God is to blame for the personal tragedy that Mac has endured. In Mac's eyes, because God didn't stop it from happening, it, happening, it is all his fault. In other words, Mac has judged God's love and found it to be lacking. This is when Sophia presents Mac with that final choice. He has to choose which of his two children will spend eternity in heaven and which will spend eternity in hell. If you've seen the movie, you know what happens next. Mac starts protesting. And she explains that she is only asking him to do something that he believes God does. And she says it this way, something that you believe God does. Sophia isn't going to let Mac off the hook either. She keeps going at him. He has to choose. He has to choose. He has to choose. But let's think about this. Isn't this the very place where God found himself? A good versus evil? This is when forced to find a cure for the disease, and we'll just, we're going to call it that, we're going to call evil a disease, because it spreads just like a disease. He was forced to find a cure, and God chose a very personal way of doing it. you and me and you and you and you and maybe all the way back to your great great grandparents and to every other single person in history in the present and in the future of the world stand that will be standing in line with death in their souls God says I won't choose between one or Several years ago, uh, another youth pastor and I, when I was a youth pastor, we would meet with a group of uh, Prairie students out of Prairie Middle School. And in the summer, we didn't want to leave a, this hole over the summer where they didn't have anything, where they weren't getting anything. So we started meeting it, and it was, I don't know if it's still out there or not, out on C Street, the Blue Strawberry. We started meeting with these kids, and we started reading through the, there's, Two different sets of books for, um, I, oh, Left Behind. I just lost it and had to bring it back in. So there's the big books, but then there's these small books, these little reader books that are for, for kids. And we started going through those. And I remember having this thought during one of the discussions with those kids. I would rather, if the tribulation happens the way that the book says, you know, the way the book depicts it, the happening where everyone would be raised and then everybody would be left here, the chaos that ensues. I would rather see those kids that were in that study go to heaven and for me to stay behind. I would be, rather be left behind than see them go anywhere else. And that changed the whole view of my ministry from there. goes back to this, I won't choose between one or the other. Take me and said, why did God say that? Because the heart of the Father is love. And this is the beauty of this verse, these two verses from John 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Love comes first as the motive. Love endures through the pain as the driving force. And love conquers and completes God's redemptive mission. This is the Father's heart laid down and broken for you. And we can know it when we're willing to open ourselves up and accept that free, not just a gift, but a free gift. There's no 
only thing he wants in return is a relationship with you. It's this free gift that he offers. So I have three questions, these two questions to leave you with today. Number one, how is God reaching out to you today? He wants to take you into his heart of love. Will you let him? Father, we thank you for this message, this series that you have given us that we can answer these important questions that have become before us. Father, I thank you that we can know your heart. As we discussed in the men's group yesterday, it comes down to basics. So, Father, we need to come back to you. We need to come back to your word. Just as Mark and I say that uh, when we preach or when we teach, we want people to take what they've heard and go back to the scriptures and read them. And not just read the individual verses, but to read around them, get an understanding of it, get a Bible that teaches the study portion of it, maybe the life application or the, even the cultural studies behind it so that you can truly understand it. Because without that understanding, Father, we cannot understand these things that we are hearing. It's just like when we look at the world, Father, we need to come back to you to be grounded so that we're not carried off by Satan, who is the king of this world. Help us to overcome that, Father. Help us to know your heart. Help us to know that you're there even in the worst of times, not just when things are going well. In Jesus' name. As we come into this time of communion this morning, I want to have you think back about the message today and what we were being told is about God's love. His love is never ending. His love is enduring. So even as we're going through the trials in our lives, his love is there all the time. We have to reach out our hand and have that relationship with him so he can help pull us through those times and those trials in our lives. And as I've mentioned before, you know, life ends eternity where we have a choice to make. Where do we want to be? And it's just like that choice that in the movie he was being given. One of your children is going to go to heaven. The other one's going to go to hell. You've got a choice to make because you're judging others. You will similarly be judged. But see, God found a way to set us free from that. And as I said earlier in one of my messages that, you know, we look at, at what happened to Christ on the cross and his hands were nailed to the cross. His feet were nailed to the cross. And he had ropes tied around his wrists and ropes tied around his feet. But see, that's not what held him to the cross. What held Jesus to the cross was God's love. He was there because his love for us <laughs> saves us from those judgments, saves us from those sins. That's what that's all about. And as we come into this time of communion this morning, communion is a time for us to come together. That's what it means. It's communion. We come together. It's a joining together. So we are joining together not only to celebrate God's love through the act of his son Jesus on the cross but also as remembering that sacrifice that he made for us so that when we, we come to that point in time because everyone is going to be judged the difference is, is he steps in and he says no the price has been paid there's no judgment here you're free because of love because of God's grace and God's mercy it's not because something we have done it's because of that grace that we are saved from our sins and saved from that judgment so on the night he was betrayed Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you take and eat participate in that body of Christ and later on in the meal he took a cup 
And after he had blessed the cup, he said, This cup is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant that I make with you today. Take and drink. And the new covenant is, is that the laws of old and the laws of Moses don't apply. No more eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth for the actions that you've done. You see, his grace, his mercy, and his love has set us free from all that. The body of Christ broken. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's great to be back. Vacation was wonderful, but had a little trauma going on afterwards when our car blew up, but uh, we made it. So God was good. I believe it was a miracle that we made it back safely. So anyway, um, it's time for prayers for the people. So if anybody is in need of prayer for anything, that's what I'm here to do. So has anybody got anybody else that they want to? I'll keep Harold on the prayer list. Well, mom, they're repeating mom. They have to repeat my mom's surgery this oh my Wednesday. Oh, no. Really? Yeah, it, it healed. I, they did this to how her pacemaker work, and oh. that's not supposed to happen. They've seen it in two percent of patients, so oh my gosh. <laughs> she's figure. feeling very horrible oh. and oh. weak, and having a lot of trouble. Oh. So, oh, I'm sure. Oh my gosh, it's so right so sorry. Heart surgeon gets it right this time. Oh, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, is there anyone else? My son starts a new job. Oh really? I don't know when. I don't. Is this Matt? Matt. I've got him on the list to pray for anyway, so. I pray for my daughter Mary, she's been having some knee trouble, it's really bad, so. Okay. For knee trouble, okay. All right, anyone else? We pray for the people in Davenport with that building fall. Oh my accident. Oh, yes, I missed all that. Father God, we humbly come before you this morning with praise, honor, and glory, knowing and acknowledging that your Bible is the living, breathing word of God. When in times of trouble, your word comforts us. When in doubt, your word speaks discernment and giving us wisdom. When in need, your word breathes life and encouragement and hope into our lives, hearts, minds, and souls. As it says in Daniel 6, 26, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. We honor and glorify your holy name. We thank you for all you have done and are going to do in our lives. We also thank you for the beautiful rainbows that you put in the skies after a rain. We are in awe of your glorious works throughout this earth. Help people to enjoy them instead of destroying them. And I just claim your glory throughout this earth. In the midst of chaos, let there be peace in the knowledge of you. And Father, we just ask um, for comfort for the families lost in the, in the uh, Davenport building collapsing. We pray for their families, Lord Jesus. We pray for all the families that have been uh, misplaced. and displaced and we just pray that you will give them home a home to live in a place to find love and peace Lord Jesus comfort them throughout all this journey and this this trial that they are in Lord God help them to find the other two that are missing Lord Jesus and um, just help people that own apartments to um, rise up and fix them before things like this happen Lord Jesus we just ask for your um, healing in all this anger and, um, and chaos that's going on with this, Lord Jesus. And we praise you for all of that. 
We lift to you this morning, Steve, Larry, Larry Harold, and um, we just ask that you stay with them each and every day. Talk with them and give them strength and courage to face each new tomorrow. And we ask for Lori's mom for healing. We ask that as she goes through this second surgery, Lord God, that you will guide the surgeon's hands, Lord Jesus. Oh, just give her peace throughout this time. Give Lori peace and, and Mark also throughout this time that they're dealing with their parents. Comfort them and give them love. Um, just just bring, bring your Holy Spirit into the operating room, Lord God, and just help them to know, give them knowledge on how to fix her so that she will have a good life after this, Lord Jesus. And we praise and honor you and thank you for this, Lord Jesus. Oh, and we lift up Terry for the healing of his shoulder, Lord God. We ask that you intervene in the healing, healing it immediately so that there will not be no surgery needed. Yet this is your will, Lord, let it be so. And we, um, we ask for Mary's healing of her knee. We pray that you will just intervene and heal her knee, Lord God. And we thank you for Matt for getting a job. We just praise you for all of this, Lord God, and we know that you are the physician, the great physician in this world, and through you all things happen. So we just thank you and praise you and honor you. We continue to pray for Demetrius, Matt, Riley, Dylan, Jason, Colt. Father, these are our children and grandchildren. We lay them at your feet so that you will do a divine work in their lives and bring them into a right relationship with you. We praise you and honor you for all that you are doing for them. Bring their friends along with them, Lord Jesus, and, or help them find new friends that will honor you as well. We give you all the glory and honor for all things great and small. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. <coughs> this does bring us to the end of our online portion of our service. For those of you that are watching online, uh, please see the, the link that will be in the the feed there for the songs that we will be singing today. But I close this out with this prayer. God, thank you that you are a most loving Father. And I thank you that you throw your arms open wide with your love. Forgive us for our misguided views of your love and compassion and of your heart. Please soften our hearts, Father, that we can encounter your saving grace and extend it to all those who, that we not only come into contact this week, but in, well into the future of, and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I hear this word from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Paul writes, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Be sure to join us next week as Pastor Mark closes out this five-week series with so you just let him get away with it? <laughs>